Nutrients. There are six major classes of nutrients based on biochemical properties. They are carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, water, vitamins, and minerals. Apart from water, which is universally required to maintain homeostasis, essential nutrients are indispensable for metabolic processes necessary for the maintenance and function of tissues and organs. Essential nutrients cannot be synthesized in the body. Non-essential nutrients are nutrients that can be synthesized by the human body, such as vitamin D. An inadequate amount of a nutrient is a deficiency. Deficiencies can be due to several causes, including dietary deficiency or any of several conditions that may interfere with the utilization of a nutrient within an organism. An essential amino acid cannot be synthesized by the human body, but it is required for its normal functioning. Therefore, diet must supply essential amino acids. Examples of essential amino acids are phenylalanine, histidine, and tryptophan. Essential fatty acids are fatty acids that humans need for good health. The body cannot synthesize them. Only two fatty acids are known to be essential for humans, omega-3 fatty acid and omega-6 fatty acid. Vitamins are essential organic molecules not classified as amino acids or fatty acids. They commonly function as enzymatic cofactors, metabolic regulators, or antioxidants. Lipid-soluble vitamins are A, D, E, K, and water-soluble vitamins are C and B. Minerals are the exogenous chemical elements. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen are essential for life, but they are plentiful in drinks and food like sugar. Other necessary minerals are calcium, for example, in the bones, potassium, chloride, sodium, phosphorus, iodine, that is necessary for thyroid hormones, iron, which is part of hemoglobin found in the red blood cells, magnesium, zinc, manganese, copper, and chromium. What will happen to the nutrients, for example, glucose or sugar, inside the human body? If energy is required shortly after eating, the dietary fats and sugars that were just ingested will be processed and used immediately for energy. Glucose will go to cellular respiration to produce ATP. If necessary, fats will go through gluconeogenesis to produce glucose. If glucose is not used immediately for energy, insulin will stimulate the absorption of and storage of excess glucose as glycogen in the liver and muscle cells, or as fat in the adipose tissue by a process called lipogenesis. Excess dietary fat is also stored as triglycerides in the adipose tissue. So as we said, glucose is stored in the form of glycogen by a process called glycogenesis. Or dietary fat or glucose through a series of processes will be stored as fat in a process called lipogenesis. Let's take a look at cellular respiration to produce ATP. Cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is a set of chemical reactions. The first chemical reaction happens in the cytoplasm, and the process is called glycolysis. This is an anaerobic process. The other two steps in cellular respirations are going to happen in the mitochondria. If we make the mitochondria larger, we can see that there is the matrix in the middle, and the matrix is where the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle or tricarboxylic acid cycle will happen. The next step is going to be the oxidative phosphorylation that happens in the mitochondrial inner membrane. These two processes, the Krebs cycle as well as the oxidative phosphorylation, are going to be aerobic processes. So cellular respiration is a set of chemical reactions that convert oxygen and glucose, as you can see here, oxygen and glucose, into carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. Carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. So the first step is going to be glycolysis. That is going to happen in the cytoplasm. Glycolysis is the metabolic pathway that converts glucose into pyruvate. Here's glucose. And through a series of steps, that we're going to produce two molecules of pyruvate. The free energy release in this process is used to form molecules of ATP and reduce NADH. Right here, you see the molecules of ATP being produced as well as NADH. The glycolysis pathway can be separated in two phases. The investment phase, where ATP is consumed, as you can see here, ATP is consumed and ATP is consumed. 
and the yield phase where more ATP is produced than originally consumed. You can see we produce two molecules of ATP and another two molecules of ATP. These two ATPs consumed are going to be canceled out by these two ATPs produced. So at the end of glycolysis, we are going to produce two molecules of ATP and two pyruvate and two NADH. So we have glucose through the process of glycolysis is going to give us pyruvate, two of those for every glucose. Pyruvate is going to be processed to create acetyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA will enter the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is a series of repeating chemical reactions in the mitochondria to produce ATP, carbon dioxide, and electron carriers, FADH and NADH, necessary for the electron transport chain. The Krebs cycle will produce NADH and FADH. These are electron transporters that are going to be necessary for this step. This is going to be the oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation uses the electron donors NADH and FADH and oxygen to produce ATP. Oxidative phosphorylation has two parts, the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. The electron transport chain consists of a series of redox reactions that occur in proteins bound to the inner mitochondrial membrane. During the electron transport chain, electrons are transferred from a donor molecule, NADH and FADH, to an acceptor molecule like oxygen. So we have right here that the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle produces the NADH and the electrons are transferred through these proteins and this is going to be accepted by the oxygen in order to form, for example, water. The energy transferred by the electrons flowing through this electron transport chain is used to transport protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane, generating an electrical potential across the membrane. So we can see that the hydrogen is transported from the matrix to the area in between the two membranes, accumulating more hydrogen in between the membranes than in the matrix, generating an electrical potential across the membrane. This store of energy is tapped when protons flow back across the membrane and down the potential energy gradient through an enzyme called ATP synthase in a process called chemiosmosis. So this amount of hydrogens in between the membranes is higher than in the matrix. Therefore, these hydrogens will flow through the ATP synthase this energy will be used to transform the ADP plus phosphate into ATP. In theory, during oxidative phosphorylation, each molecule of glucose may produce up to 32 molecules of ATP. In practice, some protons leak across the membrane, lowering the yield of ATP being produced. Glycolysis produced for ATPs. Oxidative phosphorylation is a vital part of metabolism. However, it produces reactive oxygen species such as superoxide and hydrogen peroxide, which lead to propagation of free radicals, damaging cells, and contributing to disease and possibly aging. To summarize, cellular respiration has three main steps, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. These three steps are necessary to transform oxygen and glucose into carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. Glycolysis is anaerobic, Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation aerobic.